lights, camera, Zoom. What does it take to produce a Zoom meeting? And uh, as was mentioned, this has, is being recorded. There's also a copy of the slides that are going to be available. Um, the other disclaimer is all of the pictures to showing clubs are from my own club. So uh, I'm not picking on anybody but myself. Um, so I, Lisa, uh, Julie did a great job uh, talking about online kind of things. One of the interesting things, uh, I was in a session earlier this week and they said, not turning on your webcam is like walking into a conference room with a paper bag over your face. Uh, I kind of liked that one. So where are we? Well, pre-COVID, we were, uh, we, we had our own patterns. Uh, before I became a Rotarian, I accompanied my wife when she attended PETS in her PN year. And one of the things that struck, stuck in my mind was a presentation about leading a club meeting. And that presenter commented that a club's person, a uh, president's experience is really based upon the club size. In larger clubs, there are committees that take care of p speaker sp scheduling, service project announcements, etc. And these presidents actually get a t have an opportunity to maybe grab a quick bite before they conduct the meeting. In smaller clubs, the, all of these duties tend to fall on the president. And there will be days when there, where these presidents are hiding in their car up in the parking lot five minutes before the meeting only to have a member tap on the window asking for some time in the meeting. I've been one of those people, by the way. Uh, so my experience as president of a Rotary Club that met online asynchronously was similar to that of a smaller club without the window tapping. So regardless of uh, club size, we had our usual expected pattern. You know, here's an, uh, an example of club president inducting a new member. We kind of had, we, our meetings kind of had a general flow. Well, COVID kind of uh, put a kill, killed that flow. So the other thing that's a kind of a tangent that I think is important to hear is Back, we've been talking about reduction in all forms of impersonal social interaction. Back in 1995, uh, Robert Putnam published an essay, Bowling Alone, and that, which then became a book in 2000. And he talked about an aggregate loss of membership in civic and uh, volunteer organizations. And Rotary even back in, in 2000 was busy trying to figure out how can we stay, keep, keep or maintain or grow our membership. And so in 2004, Rotary Internet uh, did a pilot of e-clubs. And my former e-club is actually one of those 10 pilot clubs. Um, we then later added in satellite clubs you know, lunch, breakfast, you know, that fixed time doesn't work for some people. So we experimented that. We started experimenting with passport clubs. And, you know, we were able to maintain our worldwide membership pretty well. When my wife was president of her club in 2005, 2006, there were 1.2 million Rotarians. When I was president in 2017-18, there was 1.2 million Rotarians. Now, if you stop and do the math, that means in the 12 years between my wife's term and my term, there were 1.4 million people that walked into the front door of our clubs and walked out the back. So we, we've, got a, we've, got, we've, we've had that problem. July 1... Worldwide Rotary membership is 1,174,890 people. Now rounding, that's still 1.2 million. But this is the first time in my experience in Rotary that we're rounding up to 1.2 versus rounding down to 1.2. So what do we do? 
So what the one of the things is, and I, I really like Holger's uh, theme of Rotary Opens Opportunities. We have an opportunity. I have a meme on my computer that says tomorrow, a mystical place where 99% of all human productivity, motivation, and achievement is stored. Lots of us have been waiting for tomorrow. In August, I had the opportunity to help uh, a order of sisters have hold their annual meeting. And the sister in her opening comment talked about, we've always wanted to be more active online and do things more online. Well, COVID, COVID gave us that opportunity. So I'm gonna be focusing in a lot more on what does it take to do a, a hybrid meeting? And if there, hybrid meetings, there's two parts of it. The, and I like using the word formats. And in the in-person format, we wanna create a space where members can come together and, and be together. And Rotary uh, International is very much about wanting us, directing us that we minimize the health risk to our members and to others in the community. And so you know, the part of that is we need to th think about some of the policies and procedures. You know, we wanna have, as we, in, we, using my own club as an example, we want to demonstrate to those that are on the fence about returning to an in-person meeting that it's safe to return to an in-person in meeting. So looking at the policies and procedures, what's the health status of the individual Rotarian guest coming into the meeting? One that's, it's a stickler in this state, mask requirement. Is it required? Is it optional? Do you take it off to speak, to sing? Obviously, you can't eat and drink with it. So, you know, what, what is that? What are the rules for that? Physical distancing. How are you able to space the tables apart? How many people do you want to have uh, per, per table? How do you deal with handshaking? We are tactile people, and we want to handshake. We want to hug. How do we do that? In, in this world. And one of the other things that's important is how do we re into, uh, do induct new members into the club? How do we recognize them for Paul Harris achievements? How do we present checks to other organizations that we're helping fund? We need to kind of work through some of that stuff. Meals. Do we want a box lunch? Do we want served? Do we want plated? Do we want to just forgo meals all together? The next one is uh, speaker location. You know, if, if the person is in the room, what is their masking requirement? How are we going to make sure that they feel safe? Um, also, microphone. It's best to have one person for one microphone. So some clubs, they've put up a microphone stand where Rotarians walk up and talk to them, talk into the microphone stand. Other clubs, they have a process of sanitizing their hands before and after they take, take a microphone and pass it off. Registration. For me, this is something that is really important. Gone, for me, Gone is the day that I wake up Monday morning going, hmm, I think I might go to Rotary at, today at noon. We need to be a little more forth thinking about that. Registration allows clubs to, one, deal with the facilities. How are the tables going to be arranged, the meals, all of that kind of things. Registration also allows us to um, reinforce meeting norms. Um, Hopefully, we don't have to use that registration in a contract tracing situation. We, may be, we could be forced to, to, to do with that. Now, there are different ways that we can do that. We can use Club Runner. We can use DACDB. My club, we're using Eventbrite. Uh, but again, it, and the other advantage that we've had with this registration, with the right spiking 
uh, cases, we've actually had to cancel our in-person registrations. We were able to identify send out individual emails to everybody that had intended to attend the upcoming in-person meeting. And then there's also CDC and county guidelines, and those can be all over the map. Also, some facilities may have stricter. Uh, I know the, of Rotary Clubs that meet in nursing homes and retirement communities. Their venue is not available. Uh, the, last, the other thing that's in here is technology, and we've, we, we can t go all day on that, and I don't want to spend time there. So the other aspect of the hybrid meeting is the online meeting. Now, hybrid meetings are not a new concept. After the Council of Legislation in 2016, the Rotary Club of Stone Mountain, Georgia, started to try and figure out how they could engage some of their members. And past district governor, Margie Kersey, how, framed it out very well. The goal of the hybrid meeting is to preserve the in-person meetings while making them available online. So what does that mean? Well, I've been to some hybrid club meetings where it's voyeuristic. It, you know, the, the, it's the, the webcam or computers in a fixed location in the room, and the, the, you may or may not hear the, what's going on in there. Uh, the other thing is you don't want to be live streaming people eating. So here's an example of from my own club where we, ha we have somebody being recognized for a Paul Harris fellow you can tell that the action's all off in that corner, and as somebody that's watching this online, you know, I'm completely left out. It's, you know, it's not necessarily making that experience available to me. Then there's, uh, you know, so one of the things that we like to do is use the grid. And if you notice in the upper right corner, you can see the people that are meeting in person. And so we're able to do, go, go through with that. And what this gives us is the ability of showing on the screen the slides and uh, some of the participants that are online. So yes, it's not the same thing as being across at the next table with somebody. It's, for me, it is the next best thing. So moving on. The, um, the, the bigger, biggest part of trying to deal with uh, hybrid meetings for me is the speaker. And I like to use the live theater analogy. Your members and guests are the audience with orchestra, mezzanine, and balcony seats. Now, when we were in the pre-COVID world, we were all orchestra seating, you know, we didn't have to do anything little to no speaker prep because they could show up with a thumb drive, their laptop, hook up to the projector, and show and and present. Now, because now our members and guests are no longer co-located, we need to spend more time and effort in attracting them and engaging them in our in our meetings. Now, I mentioned earlier that I'm past president of an e-club that met asynchronously. I was attracted to that club because I could log into that club's website day or night, attend a meeting with engaging, uh, that was engaging, that promoted Rotary Worldwide, and had informative programs. Later, when I joined that club and agreed to be, serve as president, I wasn't aware that the club's operations had devolved to the point to where it was the president's responsibility to post a new meeting each week, 52 weeks a year. Early in my president-elect year, the president failed to post a meeting Monday morning. And I scrambled to finish gathering something up and post the meeting. As weeks progressed, the frequency of my Monday scrambles 
increase to the point where the president stepped down and I stepped into the role. So I fell, fell back onto my earlier experience as a Rotary Club bulletin editor and began to char start charting out topics that would be for the future meetings. As my process evolved, I began to use the term producer to describe how I was bringing together different pieces of online content into a meeting that, so that I could produce or, and have a meeting that attracted me to the club in the first place. So when, when the Safer at Home began here, um, I used my experience to help my fork and spoon club to find its way in the digital world. Since the, qua since the quality of the speakers and their presentations are critical to attracting our members and guests for each week, I have some thoughts as far as what it, what's important about them with our speakers. And first one is scheduling. Now, I've been in clubs where the speaker schedule is out 9, 12 months. I've been in other clubs where, well, it's the second meeting in September, so we're going to have the high school football coach. You know, each club is different. Um, in my club right now, we, we're tending to schedule four to eight weeks out. Now, part of that is we need to start thinking about how that speaker is going to be interacting with their members, if they're in person or if they're if the members and guests are in person or if they're online. So one of the things you have to consider is, is the speaker going to be in person or are they going to be online? If the speaker is going to be in the room with other members and guests, that brings about a whole different set of technology and Zoom production issues than if the speaker is online. Now, I've worked with a number of speakers that Zoom is old hat. They have, they're, they're fine with it. And there's others that uh, they've done PowerPoint presentations to large groups of audience, but this is going to be the first time that they're doing something on Zoom. So, and I, I know of some clubs that they had speakers that backed away because they were not going to do it online. So that gets back to that, that previous uh, scheduling issue. Um, so I kind of touched a little bit on it as far as prepping. What does the uh, speaker need to do to feel comfortable in this environment? Um, are they, you know, uh, are, are they a pro? Are they a novice? You know, how much hand-holding um, do, do they need? Um, also, not, we can't, miss, it's dangerous to wait until the day of to make sure that they're all set and ready to go. Uh, Want to make sure that they are, that it, the show, as it were, is locked and loaded and ready to go for a live performance, which is the meeting. And so I use the ter term of Zoom operator. So that is somebody that is watching uh, the comments like Julia is doing or organizing like Lisa has done or right now myself where I'm sharing my screen and yeah, I'm not used to it, but I'm having to admit people in, into it, so that's kind of adjusting my flow a little bit. All of those things you know, you know, need to be dealt with, and sometimes, the, you, um, as what happened with this past Sunday, I had to do both um, my club president's slides and the speaker slides for my own computer because, they, because of technical issues. It's all, it's all about having that plan, thinking of it as a production versus just 
walking in and listening to the speaker. Uh, earlier, I had a quote from uh, Edward Demings, and I first learned about him back when I was getting my master's degree. And one of the things that he, that he talked about was four points of management, or 14 points of management. And these are principles for management to improve the effectiveness or, of a business or an organization. These points were originally in a paper in 1982, and then in 1986, the book Out of Crisis was written. And two of these points, I think, are very important. We want to be breaking down barriers between departments. So in the context of producing a meeting, what does that mean? Well, the person that is scheduling the meeting needs to be talking a little bit more with the person that's promoting the meeting, getting, you know, doing the social media, talking about, oh, hey, we've got a, uh, uh, a meeting in two weeks where the doctor who did the first uh, dual lung transplant of a COVID patient She's going to be our speaker. Get out that buzz, breaking down those barriers. You know, it's, we've all too often worked in silos, and we need to be breaking down, down those barriers uh, so that we produce a uh, quality meeting. The other question is, area is breaking down barriers that rob employees. Well, as Rotary Club leaders, we don't have employees. We have members and guests. And we have the community that we serve. And just because we are physically distant doesn't need, mean that we cannot make an emotional connection. We need, we need to make sure that we can reach out to the members that are struggling with technology, meet them in, in new ways. Um, and uh, listen to them. Uh, this past week, I read an article uh, by uh, Mary Barra. She's the CEO of General Motors. And one of the lines in there step, uh, stood out for me. We must listen to our own teams, engage in conversations that elevate our collective understanding, and ultimately inform our actions to make a world a better place. So I know that I've been talking. I've thrown a lot of stuff at you. So are there any, any questions? I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can see each other. So why don't people bring up ideas of what their clubs are doing now and problems they might be having in the if you're doing clubs virtually? Um, the challenge that you see, and then um, maybe Don can give us some in insight into those. So I'll ask a question, Don. Um, my club is just starting to shift into doing hybrid meetings where we've had a group of maybe 10 or 12 or so that have come into person. We meet in a banquet space, so we feel comfortable doing that. Um, I guess my two questions for you are, are you seeing um, the majority of the speakers have a preference either way? Should clubs be prepared for speakers that, you know, are trying to stick online or are wanting to go in person? And then maybe um, with that, I, you used the term, um, the experience was more like watching, like, boy, you know, you said voyeuring. Um, what are some tips and tricks? Because it felt even for me that I um, I don't appear to be with the group. So, are there other effective ways that we can um, make sure that members feel like they're a part of that experience? Um, yes, there there's there's a there's there's a couple of different different ways that um, that we can engage across across the room. Um, one because and. One of, that's one of the things that I'm really grateful that, um, well, that I, we have members in the club that want to work on both sides to have 
safe meeting. Personally, I'm one. One of the things that we did for my club is we we surveyed the members to see what was the likelihood that they would return in person versus meet online in, in a four-point scale. And a third of us, and I'm in that third, it's unlikely that we're going to attend an in-person meeting until, until the pandemic's over. And then slightly more than a third, it was very likely that they were going to attend a in-person meeting. So we've got roughly less than a third that are borderline on the, on the fence. And one of, the, one of the members is he wants to meet in person. It's very important to him. And he's very adamant about trying to create a, create a safe space. So, that, 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 so part of that is we've got, because of the technology constraints within the facility that we're dealing with right now, our webcam is in the corner. And we have people doing announcements either online or from in, in the room. And the people that are in person, they've gotten used to walking up to the webcam, doing the announcement, and uh, so, that we don't, we, so that we do feel like we're in the room. Um, another technique is um, to, to try and engage people, and I can do it right now. Um, is something known as a waterfall in the chat. So if you, everybody finds the little chat window, and I'm going to ask a question. And so it, I, if you had oatmeal for breakfast, type in one. If you ha didn't have oatmeal, have two. If you didn't eat breakfast, type in three, uh, zero. So one if you had oatmeal, Two if you didn't, zero if, and you get that, um, you get that process. That you, so you can kind of see where everybody just, it's a great, it's a great way. Um, the raising of hands um, and you, sometimes using the reactions, um, it, it, it is, it is just kind of getting comfortable about that. Uh, yes, Jim, coffee does count. <laughs> uh, so, so um, that that's that's one part of it. The other the other part of it um, is how do you use the technology within within the space? And we, because of technology, we've only had one. Um, in-person meeting, and that was when Craig came to visit our club. And so we were able, to, I was able to get somebody from the other Wogan club in town to be my second Zoom operator so that he could use his device so that we could have that device focused in on Craig so that the rest of us could kind of feel like we were we were in the room, so um, there. The, the um, I kind of touch on it a little bit in the uh, videos that Julia has talked about, and I, I'm willing to take you know help more in depth if people ha want to do that. Yeah, thank you for that. I think something you hit on there too. Um, that I've been sharing with folks as they start to tiptoe back to in-person meetings is um, having making sure it's not the the club the president you know the um, person who's leading meetings doing all of these work it's it's a lot to handle for sure yeah well we well because we have we we have a person in the um, um, uh, in the meeting, who's the Zoom operator, and he he's taking care of muting uh, because we got a really good mic, and I, it was so good that when uh, during Craig's presentation, we could actually hear the pe scraping of the utensils off the plate <laughs> of the nearby table. Not a good experience for those of us online. Uh, kind of gets back to you don't want to live stream people eating. 
Um, but she's managing all of that side of that. I'm you kind of think of it as the director in the TV, you know, camera one, camera two kind of thing. Um, and the, 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 the other Rotarian that helped us out, he was camera two. So I was the one that was kind of picking which camera we were showing within the, within the, within the Zoom meeting. So. So someone on has asked, um, are there any clubs meeting in person in 6220? We'll do about that. And, and you, Don, you might help us in 6270. In your chat, if you open your chat, right underneath all the names, you'll see a thing saying raise hand. If your club is meeting in person, push that button and it'll raise your hand and we can count how many there are there. This is another way of you can interact. I don't see any hands risen yet. I, I see a physical hand. I see the button. I don't see the button. Um, it, it, uh, in, chat, uh, in chat, you'll see all the lists of all the people. And right underneath it says invite, mute me, and raise hands. That's in the participant window, not uh, the chat window. Oh, I, I, my apologies. You're right. It's in the participant window. Yeah, I was. I got the both of them open at the same time. Uh, yeah. Okay. So raise your hand. So it doesn't look so far that anyone. I, I'm, no, I've got, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So about I'm picking one at random. Oh, die! You've got your hand risen. So you guys are doing in person. We are doing both. We, we are doing in person, and we're lucky where we meet, well, we could have outside facilities, so the distancing was great. Um, and then most recently, we have also opened up to people being able to come in through Zoom. Okay. So they can do whatever is their choice, either be there or uh, participate virtually. Okay, how about others of you that have, have got that? Suzanne Murphy, what do you have? Well, I can, uh, I'll answer for Suzanne. It's, uh, She's with our club, the, uh, the uh, Stevens Point Noon Rotary Club. We've been uh, meeting actually since the uh, first part of August, but we also have the Zoom component. Uh, fortunately, we can meet at uh, the uh, chamber in town, the Portage County Business Council, where they've got a big 73-inch screen that we can tap into off the computer. So uh, we, we have people, I know Suzanne has been attending that way, so they, they have the option. We probably, probably about a third of our club is coming uh, to the live thing. Uh, we've had speakers. We've had both uh, in-person speakers. Uh, we've had one Zoom uh, meeting where the speaker was on Zoom. And then we've also done it where we've uh, had to share the computer with something they brought to the meeting. So, uh, but our club uh, wanted to meet in person. They wanted to to be able to do that. And we're fortunately in a location where we have social distancing and, uh, and people, it's bring your own lunch. We're not, we're, we're not doing that. It's just, it wouldn't be, we can't figure out a feasible way to do that at this point in time. That's good. Do you, have there been any challenges or questions from people? Have you maintained your membership that way? Well, fortunately, uh, we've had a few members because of COVID, uh, uh, drop, but overall our membership has remained fairly steady. So uh, uh, we try to stay in contact on a week. I do as the president on a weekly basis on what we're up to. So I think that helps a little bit. Uh, and we we are an older club, uh, and we know that there's some people that just don't feel comfortable coming yet. And we'll 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 be uh, that's their wish, and we totally understand. Julia, can I pitch in a little bit? Um, yeah. At Espanaba, we've been having hybrid meetings for about two months now. Like Scott was saying, we're in a restaurant. We're in a big, we're in a big space in the back, so we get anywhere from nine to eighteen people in person. But we can really spread out in the space. And what we found luck with is, so we broadcast by Zoom and people connect well, electronically. But I don't record the whole meeting. I only record the speaker, so I'm not sending them an hour-long video to watch. I send them about 
a 20 minute video to watch with the speaker and then I'll put bullets in for like the, the business part of the meeting. I'll just put bullets in and then have a link to the, the Zoom speaker. And so it's helped us engage some of the members that don't feel comfortable coming. Um, but like Dave was saying, we've done a good job of maintaining membership, but it's really hard to grow membership right now. You know, it's hard to bring people into that space. Like we've, that's what I've struggled with. It's trying to get people to bring guests online and guests to the meeting. So we're happy to maintain, you know, standard membership. But I'm just trying for a way to get people to come that would feel comfortable. But we've also had a big increase in cases in that county. So we're kind of going back and forth. But we've had a lot of luck with hybrids, and we hope to keep doing it as long as we can. I think we want to see the face-to-face experiences. Yeah, uh, I certainly will. This is Jim Cantrell. Um, as Scott noted, we're doing hybrid. You know, one best practice that we've had, I think, is that because we're at a state facility, anybody who appears face-to-face, -face, it's probably good to do it for your entire membership, is they have to sign a release to hold harmless the, the institution. And it is a, a conference space, um, but that's good kind of like, um, you can create such things to put the put the host or the the, the site that you're using and the, the person who owns that at ease. Um, one of the one of the advantages that I think we found of doing this hybrid online and face to face environment is that it opens up the possibility uh, of individuals far beyond our service area, far beyond the city of Marquette to be able to zoom in and give a presentation. Because as many people here, I think, realize you, if you have a, an active, robust speaker series, uh, sometimes you kind of run out of, well, who, who are we going to get to present, right? It's going to be interesting and busy and what have you. So we've had a couple of Zooms with people from as far away as you know, a couple hundred miles that they come in and they give this really engaging, interesting sorts of presentations. Thank you, Jim. I, I, I'm, I'm want to be mindful of, of, of everybody's time, and I do have a couple of a couple more slides yet. But a um, lot, lot of lot of good conversation, um, and I, I will say um, that's one of the great best opportunities that we've had from my own club is um, you know, our second uh, online. Um, online meeting was the PDG from Pennsylvania. We've had Shelterbox, the individual from Arizona. Uh, I was not joking about the uh, doctor who did perform the first double lung transplant for COVID. She's going to be our speaker uh, in nine days. Uh, you know, so we're able to attract people, you know, speakers that aren't necessarily you know, local, you know, directly local anymore. So, um, as as was mentioned, um, we we here in sixty two seventy, we've been doing a uh, keeping Rotarians connected series. Um, I do want to do a little bit of promotion because we are doing our next one this next Tuesday, uh, the thirteenth. Um, and we're actually bringing in uh, Kristen Brock from the Body Language Blueprints. Um, Kristen believes that body language is our superpower and that we can use our superpower here in the virtual world. Um, and so if you're interested, the link here, I know that Julia has the link because she's registered uh, for it. So please... Uh, if you've got the time uh, and are interested, please do that. I want to thank uh, Julia and Lisa for, for this opportunity to, to share this. And I hope that now everybody is ready for their own close-up with the uh, hybrid meetings. <laughs>